Ron Paul versus the New World Order Observations and Omens by Jonathan Barlow Gee, Tallahassee, Florida, USA, June seventh through eleventh, twenty twelve. Who is Ron Paul? Having met Ron Paul in person, in so far as I was in a line to shake his hand at a book signing he attended here in my hometown, I can speak on his character from my own personal experience. To me, he reminded me of myself in a better life, in so far as, in some ways, we were the same, and those ways more pronounced in him were things I would like to have been able to better develop in myself. He is, to my assessment, shy, but he has obviously for his whole life forced himself to be outgoing. This much we share in common as a personal trait, however, which I have always failed in, and which, in his case, Ron Paul has succeeded by conquering his shyness and being able to speak well in public and to relate to any individual on a personal level. He has compassion, he has resolve and inner strength, and he has conviction that his direction is the correct one for him to be headed on. As I approached him in line to pass his book to him for his signature, I grew in admiration for him more and more, and when I got to shake his hand I smiled and thanked him in a way I hoped would encompass my full amount of respect and the sincere depth of my gratitude for his playing the part of a positive role model in my own life. Ron Paul is a 12-term Republican congressman from Clute, Texas, in the United States House of Representatives. He has written numerous books on the subjects of libertarian philosophies, the Austrian School of Economics, and the U.S. Constitution from the point of view of a public servant who is sworn to uphold it as his oath of office. He married Carol, his high school sweetheart, and enlisted in the U.S. Air Force at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis as a medical flight doctor. After leaving the service, he worked as an obstetrician gynecologist and eventually built up his own medical practice and has delivered over 4,000 babies during his medical career. He entered politics in the mid-1970s, citing his reason for doing so as growing concerns for the path the nation was on following President Nixon's removal of the U.S. dollar from the gold standard. In the 1980s, he was appointed by President Ronald Reagan to serve on the Gold Commission, tasked to investigate retooling the Federal Reserve to mint gold coin currency. In 1988, he ran against Republican nominee George Herbert Walker Bush and Democrat Michael Dukakis as a third-party libertarian candidate for the U.S. presidency. He ran again for the U.S. presidency in 2008, this time narrowly missing, garnering the nomination for the Republican Party. He is currently running for the Republican nomination to be decided this August, prior to the 2012 presidential race between the Republican nominee and Democrat incumbent Barack Hussein Obama in November of this year. Ron Paul has spent the better part of his adult life championing the cause of liberty, that is, as he defines it, the right of every individual given to us by our Creator. He further defines this cause by framing the intent of the U.S. Constitutional Founders as being to ensure our rights to personal liberty and a sound economy. Personal liberty, he goes further to say, includes the right to our person, our privacy, what we eat and drink and put into our bodies, and should also include the right to keep the fruits of our labor. A sound economy, Ron Paul further goes on to say, is given in Section 10.1, the Contracts Clause of the U.S. Constitution, as being only gold and silver. Ron Paul is a rather unique figure in all of human history. He has managed to gain a massive amount of populist support from the American voting public, as well as from many hundreds of thousands of international fans online, in a relatively short period of time, while denying to use his salary as a congressman to campaign with, 
as well as not appealing to the support of all big-name lobbying firms to campaign for him. The brush fires of freedom message has spread rapidly online, and during the 2008 campaign cycle, it was statistically certain that had everyone who supported Dr. Paul's candidacy for U.S. President been able to vote for him, he would have won. However, at that time, most of the fan base for his personality cult was larger internationally than it was accepted in the mainstream media. The subsequent formation of the Tea Party movement, a diverse group of nonpartisan, disgruntled voters, was largely created when Ron Paul did not win the U.S. presidency in 2008. Other groups, such as Campaign for Liberty online, Youth for Liberty on university campuses, and the current phone bankers and money bomb contributors for the Restore America Now campaign platform in Ron's present presidential election race, have shown strong dedication to supporting Ron Paul as their sole choice for a Republican-nominated candidate. The primary enemies of Ron Paul's dedicated campaign staff and his very loyal supporters worldwide have been the small and shrinking cabal of the New World Order-owned mainstream media. The MSM has a strong aversion to the incumbent Obama-opposed Tea Party as radical right-wing extremists, and has devoted less time to covering Paul than any other candidate, and devoted their full amount of time covering him to attempts at slandering his personality. In historical hindsight, this will appear, as it does to many of us alive now, to be a pathetic and desperate last-ditch attempt by the MSM to maintain their fading relevancy in the online direct media era of the 21st century Internet. What His Supporters Believe Ron Paul's supporters, sometimes called Paulites in the MSM, are more attached to the election of Ron Paul than any constituency has been to any political candidate in the last 75 years. Even the I Like Ike campaign cannot be considered comparable to the Ron Paul phenomenon. Although that sort of vapid populist sloganeering was matched in 2008 by the Obamanoids, the neoliberal and Zionist Democrat voters who elected Obama, the platform Ron Paul stands on, and which is fully supported by his constituency, be they called the Tea Party or Paleoconservatives, Libertarians or Austrians, etc., is stated simply, not just to win an election, but to change the whole course of history. Although he might not like to see himself as a leader of a social movement, which he defends as being comprised of individuals, many of whom don't agree with one another. The dedicated Paulites who have followed him and found him flawless since the lead-up to the 2008 election cycle know that he is a once-in-a-lifetime candidate. The Paulite faction are loyal to the death to Ron Paul, and most of them are prepared to commit to a populist revolutionary civil war inside the United States to oust the existing federal government if Ron Paul cannot accomplish their coup for them bloodlessly using the existing system of democracy. His supporters are not crazy, nor radicals, nor extremists. They are real people who believe in the value of the U.S. Constitution and who know that there is a cabal of bankers already running the federal government and the MSM that do not have the best interests of real people, like themselves, at all in their minds or hearts. Ron Paul's supporters are not stupid, as the MSN would love the U.S. voters to believe. They know what the MSM knows also, but will not admit, that Ron Paul is not only electable, having run and won 12 times for Congress, in general, but that in all polls against incumbent Democrat President Barack Obama, Ron Paul wins by a wide margin. Ron Paul is the popular choice, and unless he renounces everything he stands for and stumps for any of his status quo opponents, 
He has already clinched both the Republican Party nomination for candidate, as well as the general election for 45th President of the United States of America. However, knowing how much popular support there is for this man, the New World Order machine has sought to railroad his campaign beside massive, premature, and non-journalistic headlines announcing the Republican candidate nomination of Mormon former governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney months prior to the Republican primary election, held at the Republican National Convention, when the nominee is actually picked by all the assembled delegates. Ron Paul supporters, the so-called Paulites, have already occupied more than enough of the unbound delegate positions to landslide Romney, as well as the rest of the other still technically on the ballot, though no longer campaigning, status quo candidates right out of relevancy into the margins of the dustbin of history. The 2012 RNC will be, so long as Ron Paul is still alive and has not been replaced by a bizarro Ron Paul clone who looks like him but says and believes the opposite, a major historical event for freedom-loving patriots everywhere around the world. Unfortunately, if Ron Paul is not nominated in the Republican primaries as the GOP candidate, for 45th U.S. President, there will be a lot of very pissed-off real people who will be ready, willing, and able to execute a successful coup d'etat in Ron Paul's name against the federal government of the USA. The problem with this line of logic is that it means we will not have Ron Paul himself involved for as long a period of time. If he is democratically elected President of the USA, and assuming that election is honored by the New World Order appointed incumbent administration, Ron Paul will likely live to a ripe old age many years after retiring from fixing the national economy and repealing most of the Federal Register of Laws. If he loses the election, or worse, is assassinated, the mob he leads will be left leaderless, and the result will prove the New World Orderers, who believe humanity's natural state is violent anarchy justified in enforcing their wet dream of global martial law. What his detractors believe. As already mentioned, his detractors, mainly within the mainstream media, MSM, call Ron Paul a lot of names and accuse him of a lot of basically false assertions. The most publicized criticism of him in the MSM is over racist newsletters which were circulated under his name during his Libertarian Party run for the presidency in 1988 against George Herbert Walker Bush. The use of dirty tricks by the Bush campaign is a matter of no small amount of historical record, and although Ron Paul did not write these racist newsletters himself, and has disavowed all contact from their author, the MSM continues to blame him personally and accuse him of being racist, which is patently slanderous libel because it is untrue. However, there are a few other allegations raised against Ron Paul by his detractors, although they are no less untrue, nor any more maturely and logically formulated arguments. For example, the MSM loves to assail Ron Paul as unelectable. This is, of course, nonsense, because he is a 12-term elected congressman. They compare him to Ross Perot, the third-party reform candidate in the 1992 electoral cycle who ran against incumbent George H.W. Bush and Democrat Bill Clinton, and call him in no uncertain terms a leprechaun, and the Tea Party movement he and his son Rand Paul helped form the MSM has followed suit from other neoconservatives in the federal government itself, calling them political hobbits. The only, to my current knowledge, serious investigative research journalist from outside the MSM to attack Paul's integrity, Webster Tarpley, accuses Paul of nepotism, citing that some 60 members of his family are on his congressional payroll. Not only is that not a crime, but it is common practice among the existing cabal of the wealthy 
elites in the federal government to hire their immediate family. While Vice President of the United States, Dick Cheney appointed his own daughter to the Department of Homeland Security, a federal agency he had helped create. Even if Ron Paul were a nepotist, it would be irrelevant from the point of view of anyone alive now who thinks in a long-term historical perspective. That is about the caliber of all those charges against Paul leveled by his public detractors. However, there are other people who have a much stronger negative opinion about Ron Paul than those who express their idiocies on TV, and these people are not usually seen on TV, or, if they are, it is only very briefly and only in a position of extreme public authority. For example, the owners of the MSM and the chairs of the Federal Reserve Bank, not to mention many of the diplomats staffing the UN and NATO, as well as those economic bureaucrats staffing NGOs like the CFR, Trilateral Commission, the IMF, and World Bank. These people have almost all the money and could very easily have Ron Paul assassinated at any moment. They did it to Democrat President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. They tried to do it to Republican President Ronald Reagan. They could do it to the current Democrat President Barack Obama, if they thought he were going to step out of line. That is, in short, the entire essence of the wealthy elite's social authority, their ability to press a button and bomb anyone anywhere from a stealth drone. This is the power that Ron Paul has religiously attacked his entire life, in which, once he is elected president, he will hopefully reverse and overturn. However, there are ominous shadows underlying his role as the New World Order's detractor, considering that they have not yet assassinated him. It allows some pie-eyed conspiracy theorists to question whether Ron Paul is true to his cause, or whether he is some kind of long-term plant sent to infiltrate the Democratic Republic of the USA and subvert all popular dissenters into accepting a New World Order global government. Thus, there are public detractors of Ron Paul, who assail him with empty insults and childish jibes in the MSM on TV. And then there are those who have simply been so wounded and become so jaded in fighting against the New World Order that they actually believe Ron Paul, who is the champion of liberty, is a plant for the elites, a straw man set up to fail as controlled opposition, and this latter group sits silent, watching Glenn Beck and Bill O'Reilly, waiting for their chance to vote for Mitt Romney to prove to themselves the futility of attacking a corrupt system from within. The Message and the Messenger Ron Paul has long had a nickname among his fellow members of the U.S. House of Representatives and his colleagues in the Senate. His fellow congresspeople call him Dr. No because he has never voted to raise taxes, has never taken a paid junket, has never voted for a congressional pay raise, and always votes according to whether the bill passes his personal muster for being in line with the letter and spirit of the U.S. Constitution which has placed him in the hot seat of being the sole nay vote on numerous key pieces of neocon and neolib legislation, such as the USA Patriot Act and the TSA, recent internet censorship bills like PIPA and SOPA, as well as the NDAA relating to indefinite detention and drone assassinations being applied to U.S. citizens. Ron voted in favor of the use of force in reprisal against those responsible for the attacks of 9-11, but endorsed using the constitutional letters of mark and reprisal that would have allowed the U.S. to mark bin Laden using U.S. Navy SEAL Team 6 in 2001, when UBL was still in Afghanistan. Ron co-sponsored the Dodd-Frank legislation to audit the Federal Reserve, but ultimately did not vote for his own bill when it was passed as a referendum against the big investment banks on Wall Street, exonerating blame for the mortgage crisis from the Federal Reserve directly. In short, it is difficult to be the sole voice of opposition within a system, 
and to daily meet with the disapproval of almost all of your peers within that system, without it having any negative psychological impact on one at all. Ron Paul, although he presents a strong image of positivity, often predicts the complete economic failure of the U.S. system, and, although he never makes public calls for such, would probably not mind seeing the majority of his colleagues hung for treason. That makes him seem a very ugly sort of person to those in the MSM who refuse to research his actual positions and policies. For example, once an open mic was left on in the White House press room prior to an address by then-Press Secretary Robert Gibbs, and the reporters were overheard discussing Ron Paul. One of them quipped, Only half of us would be here if Ron Paul were the president. It is no secret that by closing five federal departments in his first year as president, Ron Paul's Restore America Now budget plan does call for gradually attritioning more than 5,000 some federal government bureaucrats. In short, yes, under President Paul, there would be government job layoffs. The truth, however, is not that these closures would be to attack his political enemies, as implied by the MSM reporter's comments, but that they are necessary to reduce the size of the federal government. The simple fact is that, at present, there are too many agencies being paid by U.S. tax dollars to provide collectively unnecessary and or personally invasive services that impede our cultural progress as a nation of individuals. You can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. The eggs to be broken in this case can either be some 6,000 federal employees thrown out of work and looking for a new job, or they can be the entire tax-paying population who would be made to pay those 6,000 federal employees' salaries by quantitative easing by the Fed inflating prices across the board. Ron shrugs off the insulting nickname given to him by his corrupt colleagues, reminding himself frequently of his wife Carol's joke about how, in Ron's case, it should be spelled Dr. K-N-O-W. However, it is clear that Years of being charged by pro-welfare statists and supply-side economists have done some damage to the poor man's ego, because at times in his speeches he has waxed somewhat emotional about being accused of hating the poor. This blanket smear, leveled by reactionary provocateurs since Lenin, assaults the premise that Adam Smith's conceptual laissez-faire capitalism the ideal free market, is responsible for the moral decay and ultimately the literal bankrupting of the American dream itself. The argument made in defense of capitalism being the American dream by Ron Paul and other Austrian economists is that the ideal free market form of capitalism has never been tried, because as soon as it had been codified as the legal tender law of the USA, large corporations began to form that eventually successfully lobbied Congress to reverse the constitutional ban on direct taxation and to create the Federal Reserve as a U.S. central bank, a disaster the original founding fathers had debated against for decades. A true free market, they argue, has a gold coin currency and tough anti-racketeering and anti-counterfeiting laws to break apart monopolistic corporations and fiat loan agencies. It is thus a fallacy to say that Ron Paul believes the market would regulate itself, because he believes in the use of government to enforce market regulatory laws such as these. It is, however, as he has said, a much more difficult false accusation for him to bear whenever it is said that Ron Paul doesn't care about the poor. The perfect message, liberty. Ron Paul's message is simple. America became great based on the principles of individual liberty as laid out in the founding documents of the nation, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of the USA, and the Bill of Rights and ongoing amendments to the Constitution. He believes that when individual liberty is maximized, there will be some people who do things we don't like, but that our own ability to seek excellence and pursue a life of virtue can allow us to lead by example, and thus allow us to preempt the use of force using diplomacy. 
Ron Paul's greatest single contribution to the narrative of the debate at this juncture in history is the simple statement, we should apply the golden rule to international relations. If we wouldn't want another nation doing it to us, we should not do it to another nation. Statements of this magnitude have earned Ron Paul the greatest amount of campaign contributions in both 2008 and now in 2012 from active duty armed service personnel. His first executive order, he has stated as president, would be to bring the troops home. He intends to close all foreign military bases and restation all troops within the U.S. borders. The greatest idea Ron Paul has proposed for his budget plan to restore America now is to allow the circulation and ownership of gold and silver coins as parallel pricing structured competing currency circulating at the same time as U.S. dollar Federal Reserve notes. This sort of idea for not only how to attrition out current social problems, but for how to replace their causes with a better cure that will prevent the symptoms from reoccurring, is truly a feat worth of inspiring such a broad-based social movement as we can find among Ron Paul's Paulite followers. Although Ron Paul has often said, the peace candidate always wins, he has met with great opposition in the MSM from within the GOP, where the majority of candidates backed by the Republican Party are very hawkish pro-war personalities. For as long as he has been in Congress, which has been since the mid-1990s under then-Democrat President Bill Clinton, Ron Paul has decried the drums of war beating to put economic sanctions on Iran, which he has long forewarned us was the neocons' long-term target in the Mideast, a region where Ron Paul believes the U.S. should not be involved at all. Regardless of his position on international relations with other sovereign nations, be they on George W. Bush's Axis of Evil Enemies list, or those in the EU who have been long-term allies of the U.S. and who are now suffering a Federal Reserve-caused economic crisis, Ron Paul's belief in the need to bring our troops home to defend America's borders poses a much larger challenge against the military-industrial complex than his position of non-interventionism being slandered as isolationism in the MSM and Mets. In 2008, when Ron Paul was running for the Republican nomination, journalist Benjamin Fulford interviewed John David Rockefeller Jr. and asked him if he had ever heard of Ron Paul's platform to end the Federal Reserve. Rockefeller's answer was, no, he had not heard of him. It is not for any lack of historical impact his beliefs have on the facade of the status quo in the establishment that the rich elite planners of the New World Order are ignoring the threat to their oligarchical hegemony in the form of a U.S. President Ron Paul. The heads of the New World Order's planning bodies are simply, themselves, largely isolationistic from any views outside their own. Ron Paul's message of peace is catastrophically fatal to the plans for a global government of the New World Order that depend on wars, rumors of wars, disease, poverty, and death. Restationing all the U.S. military troops currently abroad back home within the U.S. borders will break the DoD and Pentagon's military empire, and without the threat of state force, the coercion by rackets such as the Federal Reserve and IMF will lose all authority. The Imperfect Messenger Ron Paul stutters. Sometimes, while speaking out loud, he makes statements that are potentially confusing to his listeners, although which make perfect grammatic sense if read written down. Once Comedy Central Daily Show news anchor John Stewart referred to Ron Paul as a bit of a pen and paper guy, referring to Ron's tendency to get carried away while speaking extemporaneously, and then still be able to bring his point back around to the initial premise, even after a long interjection of additional information, using simple topical points at pivotal moments in his speech. 
A lot of Ron Paul's unique delivery in speaking is due to his own interior struggle to maintain his level of personal confidence in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds against him. As I mentioned before, when I met him, I instantly connected to Ron Paul's shyness, which is so obvious to me as someone who is also shy. He has long struggled to overcome his humble nature and to become a stronger public speaker. It is this humility in his delivery that has opened the door for his detractors to accuse him of being like a leprechaun and to make humor of his personality, or worse, allowed them to gloss over, marginalize, and ignore him altogether. What his supporters believe. Doug Weed, a chief staffer in the Restore America Now 2012 Ron Paul presidential campaign, once referred to Ron Paul as a Gandhi-like creature. This is indeed how this spry yet slender 77-year-old great-grandfather appears to his Paulite supporters. His irreproachable adherence to his beliefs Incorruptible in the face of offers of money, fame, power, and coupled with threats of death and torture, defamation, and death threats against those he loves, has earned him among his supporters a deeper level of adherence and strength of hope than any politician since J.F. Kennedy. That he chose the Republican Party to base his platform of libertarian ideals within is only, he often admits, to win elections because it is impossible to do so if you are in a third party outside the strict two-party system. And he speaks from experience, having lost as the third party libertarian candidate in 1988. However, as it is quite clear in this case, oftentimes the politician's affiliation to a political party means less to their constituents than do the personal beliefs of that politician themselves. Ron Paul not only decries the status quo establishment, he has proposed an alternative to it that would be preferable to anyone else who is also disenchanted with the existing system. During the earlier months of the 2012 election cycle, Ron repeatedly met MSM challenges to his credibility, based on his age and health, by saying he would challenge any of the other candidates to a 10-mile bike ride in 100% humidity in Texas. In short, the only complaint anyone who has heard Ron Paul's message can level against Ron Paul himself is that he is too good to be true. This sort of cynical skepticism threatens us with the end of the American middle class. What his detractors believe. Ron Paul's detractors believe they can use him as bait to lure out the opinions of all their potential political enemies and then round them up and put them into concentration camps. They, and I must specify, comprise an incredibly numerically small group of people. However, they are both serious about that threat and capable financially of carrying it out. In short, the small cabal wish to think of Ron Paul as controlled opposition, regardless of whether they are letting him in on their use of him as such or not. To this extent, they find him useful and allow him to go on about his daily business, unaware they are purposefully letting him live for their own nefarious reasons. His detractors, both those who plot his downfall as well as those who simply see no future for him, consider him as appealing only to a fringe of socially marginalized losers, the hippie types that President Nixon had once dubbed radical muckraking liberals. This, of course, is simply not the truth. The liberty message is not going away, and the more Ron Paul's predictions of the decay of American values the New World Order incrementally imposes on the American people, the more angry everyone gets. Ultimately, the populists do not blame the messenger, and only, as I say, a very small number of very rich people on this planet right now are even thinking how to exploit or exterminate him to their own benefit. Ron Paul's detractors, for the most part, are elitists. They look down their noses at other people and ultimately trust nobody. What they believe about Ron Paul is the same as they believe about his supporters, and the same they believe about everyone, 
They are stupid, worthless wastes of resources, and they deserve to die. You see, for as much good as there is expressed in the liberty message of Ron Paul, there is at least as much evil bottled up inside the hearts and minds of the rich elite in the New World Order. 